with some data sets of interest, and you're trying to adopt AI into your, into your workflow or AI into your, into your daily jobs, don't, don't panic yet, because everybody else is like you in the same space you are. And getting AI maturity is actually a journey. We're going to talk through how three use cases or the four use cases we're going to present went through that journey. It's a journey that starts with problem formulation all the way to the top, playing around with the toolkit, and matures all the way to saying, have I created a model that's interpretable and explainable? And so what we're going to do in the next few minutes is basically walk you through how Cray has solved most of the top parts of this for you in terms of infrastructure and what you're going to need to be able to solve it. And we're trying to help you guys figure out if you have a problem well formulated, how can we get you to the inside the fastest way with the Cray we have here? So hopefully with that introduction, we'll see some of the use cases that we're going to talk about. So the first use case I'm going to talk about is now is now casting. So the idea is weather forecasting is hard and expensive. And we would like to be able to do very short-term forecasting very quickly. Uh, generally fair, fairly locally. And there's physics-based simulations, but they they can be very expensive to, uh, to run. Uh, often you know, you'll have trouble finding out what the what a good prediction for the weather is in ten minutes because it might be more than ten minutes to run the simulation. Uh, so we're going to start from historical data. We're going to do all all the, all the hard computation happens in advance. Uh, advantage of machine learning is that you have your training phase, but that inference is often a lot lot faster and cheaper to do. Uh, to start with the pipeline. So we started with data stored on uh, Amazon's S3 from the NOAA. We sent it over to a, to a Cray uh, Eureka GX, uh, where we used Spark to take the radar data files and you know, convert them into you know, 3D projections of the data. Uh, using PyArt and Spark. And then we stored the tensor, <coughs> tensors and sent, them and sent them back up so that we could forward them to the Cray CS storm where we ran TensorFlow. Uh, we ran TensorFlow in big DL. There's, so this slide covered actually a lot of that same ground in, different, in a different way. You start with the S3 instance. Uh, our data collection is just historical radar data. Uh, we're going to talk about Seattle because that's where we're from. Uh, and if you're interested in all sorts of details about how complicated weather is in Seattle, Jim will be happy to speak with you later. <laughs> uh, we, call, we say they had rain, or we say that something is raining if we have 0.1 inches. And we have radar scans every five or 10 minutes. So we, we process that into big giant tensors. Uh, the specific details aren't so important right now, uh, but we get a time series of images, uh, sometimes called video, but we won't do that. And then we're going to stick it into a deep learning framework and see what we can get out of it. So here's what our output looks like. So the top, so the top row is the observed output. This is what actually happened. And you can see it has more detail, but largely follows the same pattern for about 90 minutes that uh, our predictions did, uh, with, of course, higher accuracy 10 minutes from now than an hour and a half from now. Uh, so we're going, to, we're going to focus on three metrics uh, for this. There's the false alarm rate, so what, how often do we say it's going to rain and then it doesn't? Uh, the probability of detection, which is more or less how often are we correct about it raining. And then the critical success index, which is yeah, hits over hits plus misses plus false alarm. So anything that's not, it didn't rain and we said it wouldn't rain, is the denominator. Uh, and, you yeah. When you're looking at very short-term weather, the very first thing you should think is, oh, it'll probably be pretty much the same as it is right now. Uh, today has been a glorious counterexample to that. <laughs> <laughs> and today's weather has been very Seattle-like. <laughs> so here we have three hours of predictions. 
the solid line is guessing it'll be the same as what as it is. Uh, naturally, for like 10 minutes, that's a really, really good uh, model. But an hour and a half later, it's not so great. Uh, both POD and CSI, higher numbers are better. False alarm rate, lower numbers are better. The dotted line is what our deep learning model predicts, though. So you can see that in all three metrics, until you get to about two and a half hours, we're doing substantially better. Deep learning does substantially better than the baseline of, ah, I looked outside an hour ago. So I'll take a moment to talk about scaling efficiency, because you're not here specifically to learn about weather. Uh, you're here to talk about how deep learning can help, help you and why it would be useful. So here, we scaled using big DL up to 128 CPU nodes. And even and with 44 cores, we, got, we, we only spent about half of our time in communication uh, in this model, uh, all the way at 128. Now, an important thing to, to think about, and I'm going to go into more detail on the next slide, is that big DL is not the most optimized uh, scaling framework. Uh, so here we do have, we have some GPU numbers. We only go up to 16, but uh, my understanding is that Maui has eight GPUs, so these numbers should be pretty good for us. And we got up to and we only got down to 99.4 percent efficiency, so that's 0.6 percent of time spent in communication. GPU scaling is a much harder problem than CPU scaling because GPUs are fast. And, but here, the big difference is that instead of using Big DL, we use TensorFlow and we use the Cray plugin, which is a piece of software that is installed on, on Maui as part of the Eureka package. And it is designed to efficiently scale deep learning. So, without, so basically, big DL without trying very hard, we can get we we can still have 50% compute efficiency. But you know, if you trust us to do it, to tell you how to do it, 99.5% up to 16 GPUs. Uh, I think that on so I, we have we didn't run this specific example, but on other things going up to a few to. Did we go up to 1,000 GPUs, Ron Gun? Uh, yeah, 10,000 GPUs, yeah. up to 2,000 even. Okay, 2,000 GPUs, we had 95%. Uh, so we're very proud of the plugin. And, yeah, and just as a baseline, the, num the number of samples you know, processed per second, this is training, which is much slower than inference. At 16 GPUs, we were going through 400 uh, samples, each one representing about a five-minute interval every second. So certainly, with deep learning, now casting is possible because we can compute faster than real time. So unfortunately, here we're back to big DL numbers because I don't have the ones for the graph for um, the plugin. Uh, so holding the accuracy constant, we scaled and we trained and we trained, and we can see that up to a point the wall clock time decre decreased. Uh, here it started increasing just because the efficiency will end up dropping down to about 50%. Uh, with the 95% efficiency that we get with the plugin, uh, we would see almost a perfect linear decrease in time from uh, from start to find to solution when training. Uh, final thing about now casting is that well, a lot of people have probably told you that more data is better, uh, especially when it, when it comes to machine learning, especially deep learning. So we train models with one, three, five, and seven years of historical data, and our critical success in index increased more or less linearly as we increased the amount of data. Uh, it's, a fair, it's, in a, it's still in a fairly narrow band, it's a shallow cur curve if you look at the, uh, the y-axis, but it's a very clear uh, improvement as more data. So the more data available, the better. Uh, are there any questions on 
this before I go to the next use case. Okay, we're good. Okay. Hey. Now we're going to talk about climate patterns. So you run a climate simulation, you might want to find extreme data, or you might want to look at a satellite image and automatically find the hurricane that's about to hit you. So started off, this uh, started off as an, inter, as an intern project where they took images from simulations, they hand drew boxes around interesting, uh, interesting phenomena. So here's a few tropical storms. Um, I, I am not a climatologist, so I am not able to personally identify everything in the image. Atmospheric rivers <laughs> and the weather fronts. Yeah, there's weather fronts and there's atmospheric rivers. Um, and then they didn't just use image, use a basic like satellite image. They had many layers of, they had many channels of additional information going into things. Uh, and again, I don't actually know the details of what these channels are. And then, because it was an interim project, they did, they asked, what is the simplest machine learning problem we can solve with this? And that was, given this input, the input of the, of the boxes that were, that were hand generated, can we train a neural network to tell us which of these extreme, extreme weather events uh, is it? And here we have the test accuracies, and we can see that the convolutional network does very well. But so do some. But in most cases, so do at least one tradi more traditional machine learning technique. So one question is. How is, are they actually learning the correct things or are they just you know, getting it right because they happen to get lucky? Uh, is generally speaking, logistic, reg logistic regression is not complex enough to do, very, to do terribly much with images usually. Uh, usually you want something more sophisticated. So in order to test whether it was actual, so in order to make sure that they were learning actual useful things, they proceeded. And they developed an autoencoder model. So here, they trained a neural network to given given an image of extreme weather to just reproduce that image from a very compressed middle ground. Uh, the idea being that if it can do that, it probably learned something actually relevant. And and of course, then you can build a classifier out of that. You can all, and then you can stick a classifier right here in the middle and even bounding box regression to find uh, special th uh, find things in the images. Because, because if, you can go, if you can do the whole de encoding, decoding, then the middle must still have a lot of information about what's going on. Uh, so this paper is the 15 petaflop paper that Ron got mentioned. It's from SC last year. And some of the results, so the way that you convince yourself that an autoencoder works is you take pictures, you put them through, and you look to see how different they are. And you can see that these correspond fairly well, the, the images on the left and the right. Uh, the hardest thing for an autoencoder is solid space. And you can see that that one is far and away the worst correlation between the two. Uh, but that's because Generally, a neural network at least starts with very random with random weights. They move after that, and if you feed constant numbers in, you know, the way they're going to do different things in different space in different places. So you're not likely to get constant numbers out. And we'll close on a preliminary slide from a paper that's on the archive that I believe is going to be at SC this year. Uh, which is going to have 30 <coughs> pedophiles in the title. And here, instead of using uh, the autoencoder and just a classifier, they trained uh, adversarial networks. So those uh, generate images, and one of the, so you have two networks then, one generates images, the other tries to tell you if your image is fake or not. Uh, in order to train the first one to create very realistic images. And it not only did that, it, they, they used it to generate 
bounding boxes for extreme weather events so that it would find them, it would find them which was in some sense what their original goal was, but that seemed way too hard to ask an intern to do in a couple of months. Uh, so you can see that the green boxes are the truth. This is what human experts looking at this say, these are interesting weather events that we should be, more, that we should be uh, studying. And the red boxes are what the model predict, predicted there are. So I it missed this one and that one. Uh, it, drew one it drew one box around two that are next to each other, which is a fairly standard thing to have happen. But the other cases, it was, fair, it was fairly accurate. Sometimes it, it, narrowed, it, it, it narrowed in a bit. Like here, it very much picked up on this rather than the bigger structure. But if it had labeled that, a human could look at it and say, oh, I should be looking here. Uh, and next up is life sciences and healthcare, which is wrong on again. Are there any questions before I turn things back over to him? Just one question. When you were um, feeding that, um, that latest lot of data into the various models other yeah. than the deep learning, what was the form that the data was, was hitting the model? Was it just raw pixels or had it had some feature extraction? No, it was, it was raw pixels. It's, small, even small, it's, it's not even a complete image. There's only the ROI, pixel segmented ROI. So mm -hmm. and yep. so it was only those little pieces that was yeah, there. They, yeah, they were, they were all given the same input information. Right. So they were all vectorized and given us the same So how big was the data set? Uh, yeah, we were just talking about it in the morning. The, the, the initial data that was created was a few album samples, the initial plots, but for the 30 plot platform, I believe there was a lot more. Like, you have to look at the paper, we don't know the number on it, one head. It's also, that also involves generating data, data so, so it's much easier to have a lot of data when you have an effective data generator. Yeah. So that's the petaflops. For how many seconds was it? So, so the petaflops. The GANs are, are tricky things to train, right? So they train for multiple days, I believe, two, two and a half days on that model, just to, just to converge. But it hit pretty, so the three part of our number is the peak it hit when it was training, right? It's not the, the number that it sustained for one and a half days. I'm, I'm just a bit curious about some yeah. like total CPU. Uh, yeah, so, so that, and that was run, the three part of our was 3,000 cores on KNLs at NERSC. So that's, uh, do that have a question? Okay. <laughs> All right. well, maybe you can do it offline. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? No. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. So what I'm going to do now is talk to a talk about when I, when I switched over to Charlie that you've got three things you can do on a certain computer really well that you already have. One was cloud analytics, the other one was matrix methods, and the third one was doing deep learning. So now I'm going to talk about how you can creatively put all these three pieces together to answer some really interesting questions. So I'm going to talk about a use case that I personally worked on at the Tokyo National Laboratory, and it's a use case where we took millions of papers, ingested them to help biomedical researchers to come up with interesting knowledge nuggets to get this work from it. So the challenge was the following. So there was this health data institute that uh, Oprah National had a farm, and we were working with all kinds of interesting people from the VA to the Fred Hodge to whoever it was, and they would all come to us and say, you know, yeah, would it be really nice to have a competitor to what Watson did? but not replace us as doctors, but be more of an intelligence augmentation platform. And so the questions that we would get were all over the place. If you would get questions about, how does carpet venom and a tumor markup, how does it work as a tumor marker? I don't know if you, any of you that have seen that uh, poster over there, you would say, write a check to carpet venom as a tumor marker all over the US. How can three associations be put together? How can they be discovered in terms of multi-combinational pathways? And the doctor would come in and ask questions about, I have a patient that I have not diagnosed yet. None of the traditional standard of care diagnostic techniques are working. I know that he has high levels of pretty financial signs of muscle weakness. He's walking awkwardly, but I don't know what disease he's suffering from. Then you get questions about, I have this molecule that I've researched for 20 years. I also want to know about some of the molecules that you include as part of my, my drug preparation, whatever it is. What are some chemicals that you think about and so forth? So if you think of the breadth of this problem, you're looking at what humans can cannot really do today because and what I've heard from researchers, it takes about eight months to read through 25,000 papers, 25,000 titles, 2,500 abstracts, and about 250 papers in depth before you can actually create a hypothesis and you, go, you can go test. So the challenge we took upon was, can we take the data that's out there with the National Health Medicine that always publishes the, anything that's an abstract level, it's free, anything that's about central and contributed, it's free, so you can download and use them and ingest them and so forth. But we did get lucky with another project where we got full text access to these papers. And so the challenge was, can you take all these open sources of data, that's pure text and so forth, and can we do something to help augment 
why we do research in this space. So this is where deep learning takes in. So we started thinking about automatically understanding text. And so this is where the DARPA deep dive project was currently going on the a couple of years ago, where given a text sentence like that, aggressive combination chemotherapy, the management of hypercalcemic renal failure. That's, you know, what is what in that sentence? Right? So what, which one's a noun? Which one's a word? Which one's an adjective? Which one's an adverb? It's just, it's just everywhere. So what we did there was train a model that becomes biomedical specific that in addition to saying this is a noun, this is a verb, and this is, this is something else, would start associating these noun phrases, these combinations of <coughs> nouns and adjectives, into something that's much more organized from a biological and ontology perspective. So it would say, hey, I got this noun phrase, it says, here's a modified noun, modified noun with a header, and so I would group that, aggressive combination chemotherapy, and call it combination drug therapy, that fits into this mesh ontology that the National Medical Medicine put together. So we were using this deep learning as an augmentation barrier on top of part of speech tagging, on top of the natural language processing barrier to make something domain specific. So once we had that, we, we, we had all these classes of interest. So we had all these meta level classes of saying if this is a word, it probably is a chemical, if it's probably a substance, it's probably a disease, it's probably a symptom, it's probably an injury. They had all these meta level terms and abstract out of different terms. And we said, can we learn these patterns by just reading through sentences? So reading really through sentences, noun phrase, noun, noun phrase, noun, noun phrase, noun, subject predicate, object, kind of form, can I now start extracting patterns? and find out what are these emerging predicates that come in the middle. So if it picks treats alone, what all can be treated with what other things? Right? So pharmaceutical substances can treat a disease. A medical device can treat a disease. A therapeutic procedure can treat an injury. So when you think about the predicate list, we came up with about 50, 60 of them working with the National Library of Medicine, where we said, on the mesh ontology that has 2 million meta-categories, can we classify the 17, 80 million words used in the medical literature so far into this conceptual framework of here is subjects, here is meta level aspects of the subjects, here is all the predicates that are of interest to us, and can I extract that body of knowledge and represent it into a much simpler form that I can reason with going forward? To do that, we had to come up with a different creative method. So, this uses some of the uh, gray matrix methods that I talked about, where you have to do this map to say for every word, I'm going to map it to a topic, and some words can be multiple topics. So, you formulate this as a machine learning problem where it's a half list of all words here have the list of all possible classes here. And when every time this class occurred, I want to learn the patterns of what other predicates occur with that class. So the next day class, I'm talking about my So I to say, this is my word of interest, I assign. Assign is also an organic chemical. It's also, I don't know what back is, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a tag. So this is an organic, it's a virus, and this is, again, I can't remember what peapock is. But those are all the tags that, that have come with mesh, right? So we came up with, here's the list of all words. This is a list of all categories. This is a list of all predicates that go with words and categories. Now, can you learn topics and organize that in, a, in an intelligent way? So this was done with uh, these matrix methods. And, and this is even a step further. Right? This is more recent work that uh, Dr. Mogby in the back has, has worked on in augmenting what, what I just showed you by putting together open, shared knowledge bases that's also out there for biology. Right? And so I'm going to try and link the two efforts. So this was some completely different effort that won the best paper award this year. But what happened here, and you can combine that with literature, and you can imagine the other possible that, uh, that that you guys can get access and so forth. So we already pre-integrated this data set, 47 billion knowledge nuggets in it. So we put together biomodels, we put together ensemble, we put together reactor, we put together unique products, and so forth. And I talked about the graph analytics engine that we had that can handle a thousand times big data sets. So this is the kind of data set that you can really, really reason with. Seven terabytes of data, you can interact with it almost live once it's loaded up and so forth. And so, just to compare ourselves and how we beat everybody else, if you did the same thing on Oracle, your load time for the data set alone will take you about 115 hours. It takes us 22 hours on our system. Our closest competitor in terms of the query engine, the ease of use is Cambridge Semantics. They take just as long for, uh, for, 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 for loading. All three axes, you're seeing that for interactivity, it's not just ad hoc, subject matter driven, hey, is this pattern over there? But also to see, finally, the top 10 things that you look at. We do way better. So, Cambridge and Semantics is, is, a, is a quite eccentric approach to graph analysis. Oracle is also a quite eccentric approach. We don't care. We could have arbitrary diameters, we could have arbitrary, arbitrary uh, shapes of those graphs. And you can be really critical about how you construct the graph and ask questions about the spectral properties of the graph. The other two databases, people that are from the database community would know, can do the graph theoretic analytics as much as it can do the set theoretic and, uh, and, and the associative, uh, associative discovery that, that, that it's made, made to do and so forth. So once you have this kind of capability, just imagine the order of the possible that you can do with it. Right? 
back to deep learning again. So if you had a data set like that, now imagine what you could do if you had an algorithm like DeepMind does. If, you're like, if, if you figured out how to play Flow, then you take a similar algorithm to play the game of fill in the blanks. And what I mean by that is you come up with a hypothesis, and you're saying, I want to write a sentence now. I want to write a paragraph now. I want to start with a word that I know, that I'm interested in, and I want to end with a word, or, or make sure those two words are in the paragraph somewhere. Now add all the terms that make the most sense to be in that paragraph, and write that paragraph out for me. Let me decide if it's going to be a valuable paragraph or not from a scientific perspective. Now you train, now that you have 27 million abstracts, to see how good can you really get if you were to write your own abstract based on what's there, what's out there, right? The difference between what a Google and a PubMed that you probably are used to using today versus an approach like this is that a Google or a PubMed thinks that documents are independent of each other and that you've lost context when you go from one paper to another paper that could have been transferred as an association. By doing what I just showed you and tagging them all in one sense and then organizing them in the form of knowledge nuggets, I can now do a monthly document search. Right? I can connect this dot and I can say, next thing is an Omoprazole, that's a proton pump inhibitor that disrupts heartburn, and that that reasoning came from multiple papers, and I have not lost my provenance when I did that. I can always go back to the source. And it's not a predictive model that just hang wave and said, I'm going to always predict your disease. Right? I can come up with as many connections as you want, and you can evaluate is this connection valid or not. You put in your domain expertise and say, ah, that paper is iffy, I don't like that author. And you can pick it out and it reasons again, but it goes now and searches for a different answer. So we apply this in a very interesting context. And so this is a historical clinical pathological conference that happens every year in Baltimore where doctors get on a panel, and it's the last day of classes, so the students and interns are also there, and they take a character from history. Right? So this is uh, the character Oliver Cromwell, this one is Anna Christina Olsen, painting from Microbiot. And what they do, so what they do is they take these characters, these people have you know, interesting medical histories, controversial life, mysterious death. Right? And they get on a panel, read these biographies, read those medically relevant facts, and brainstorm, how did this person die? If this person walked into my office today, what would I treat him with? What would the standard of care be? How would I put him through this pathway? Right? So this is the conference. So in 2015, they came back, they came, us, uh, they came to Oak Ridge and uh, they said, you know, we want to have two supercomputers compete on it. I won't mention the other supercomputer, but you can guess that pretty well. And so that's what's happening, happening right there. So there is people, doctors, sitting on stage, using a tool, trying to figure out what this person died in 2015, and this is 2016. So this is the and for doctors, you may, you may know that this is the place where the first ever autopsy was done, the University of Baltimore system, so that's, that's the significance of this place. And so the input was paragraphs like this, right? So random paragraphs where this patient, like an artist, who made her famous, was a good woman, an outsider, though she was not always, always so. She began life as a small, blonde-haired girl, this is in the middle, blah, 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 right? So there's all this text. Quickly, you know how to tag them in a biomedical sense, so you're able to just find out what terms are biological, what terms are temporal, what terms are relationships and ancestry terms and so forth, so that was easy to do. Once we had that, we said, can we play this game of fill in the blanks? Now take these words, right, and walk towards diseases. Tell me if my endpoint was a disease, and I played this game of fill in the blanks and writing paragraphs that contained all these words that I had, what diseases am I walking, with, walking to, and with what higher probabilities. But in 2015, we came up with a list of 10, and interestingly, the, the doctors there helped us quite a bit. They said, hey, you guys are not doing well, here's a few more labels, here's what you need, and so forth. And we took, we took their inputs before we could come up with that answer, or just had this answer. So what happened then was that Dr. Sanjay Singh, he'd given the same problem to his residents and interns. And he said, you know, there's two, two supercomputers coming and competing, why don't we do a human exercise to see if humans are still better than supercomputers? And so three of them had come up with malaria, three of them said poisoning, one of them said vasculitis, one of them said acute leukemia, and that's the list of all diseases that they come up with. Interestingly, anything in bold in 2015 was something on our prediction list and on the hypothesis created by the cover source experiment. 2016, we inverted the problem. We said, let's not take input from the doctors, let's see how far out and how stupid do we look as a computer that come up with the diagnosis. And we came back with the result in two days, taking the exact similar strategy of taking a paragraph, extracting words, and doing the exact same thing. And we came up with these things. So the three bullets, three bold things you see, are all three hypotheses that the doctor considered. And so he comes up with uh, the experiment and he says, I'm not going to let a supercomputer beat me this year. I'm coming up with this sharp code to disease with this particular counter-resistive mutation in the gene. And I'm basing this on a recent paper that came out that studied uh, a Swedish family of uh, patients and therefore it's, it's going to be this disease. So what was interesting was that 
we had come to the exact same answer, but using a completely different path that adopted it. The doctor was using, so the paper was still the same, but the way we reached the paper, we didn't take six months, we took two days, but then two days in fact. But the fact that brought us over to the paper was in the first couple of sentences that I read. Remember I said the girl had blonde hair, and her father was Swedish, and, and, then, and then the connections were all happening behind the scenes. Right? So this is, everything in black is the automated part, where you've got blonde hair passes this particular protein to coexist with this in mammals, and it coexists with the other NDMR2 protein that's associated with this particular disease. So you walk through these connectors that you wouldn't have if you had to read 5,000 papers. Right? So that's what happened. And so the, the key to take away is you can build a search in a common real space. Whether feature space is not defined, it can be a black box, and you can have evidence to prove that it's interpretable and explainable. So that's that's the key. Well, how I'm doing on time over here? Yeah. So I'm three, almost three minutes. So I'll stop here and open up for questions. If there's not enough questions, I'll, I'll open up for another use case. So use case or questions? Yeah. So it's reasonably easy put. Um, Say your, your own proprietary evidence into the database. Yeah, thank you. So, so, yeah, I, I don't think you got the question that you're asking. Um, how easy is it to put your own uh, organization's proprietary kind of information into a database? So, so this is exact. So the CGE is constructed exactly for that kind of thing, right? So we have a knowledge base model. So we've got a biograph DB also, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah, but biograph DB, the DB, and we put it a little more. The tooling stuff was a slightly integrated version of the biograph DB. And so, if you want to bring it on data set, it takes some, depending on who's available, Charlie and Jill, they know what they're doing. If there's something new, then you can bring it up to speed. It takes a few days to convert them into the formats that you would need for this, uh, for integrating it with this. You'll we'll probably spend a day or two figuring out what's important to you. And, and I would say, I would plan a few weeks to a few months depending on the complexity of the data and everything else to say. Can I post this data with respect to what we already have? And then ask questions on top of it afterwards. <coughs> There's been a successful use case of uh, doing that. So we had a doctor come in with some written up with the data sets. And that's a different story. I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a uh, semantic graph database. And um, uh, one of the, they're often used for combining uh, varied data sets from all over the place. Yeah. And if it's already in uh, RDF format, of course, it's, it, you simply load it and uh, all the inter internal connections are made automatically. There's no joins or anything like that. Um, if it's not already in RDF format, then uh, you have data conversion. Like that's some of the time that he was talking about. But, but um, uh, the, the strength of the technique is to combine uh, many disparate sources of data easily. So do you have evidence of um, kind of doctors using the infamous uh, variance of unknown significance? So, Excellent question. So. That's uh, exactly the same slide I had with the cancer targets. And so, so, so yes, there is, so we have workflows that are separate to find out the variants of the pools, right? Those variants are unscripted. That's a separate HPC workflow. But then association of those boos to the pathology reports, association of those boos to the phenotype and so forth. That's where the data database comes in, right? And so this was a cancer use case we did with MD Anderson, where we worked with real doctors to actually do it. And there's actually a paper published out of this. So we took that open data. I think some of you may be really interested that this this effort you're just going to quickly go through this. So it took different kinds of data put together. And so we had to integrate HPC kind of workflows that are traditionally done with genomics with uh, what we already had in terms of semantic knowledge. We are trying to combine what you can extract from your genomic databases with what you can with the uh, reason with the semantic, the semantic uh, engine. And then I believe, I'm just going to quickly go through this, this was the uh, system we put together where we said, hey, can we load up all these data sets that are not semantically friendly? Can we load up the knowledge bases that are semantically friendly, create the connection between them statistically, do the analysis of correlation statistically on it, then come up with discoveries by looking at it over the longitudinal history of, uh, of the patient over the clinical trial. And then I think the answer to the question was, uh, the question that was asked on that data was, find me new targets that go through this particular pathway, and what have people studied in different protein databases and different genomic efforts and different you know, discovery efforts for drugs and veterinary medicine and so forth. So we were able to put all these pieces together and come up with a few clinical targets. This is a paper that was published in uh, in Cancer Informatics, I believe. I think we had a reference somewhere. Maybe not. Yeah. Anyway, so that's uh, to answer your question, yes. Yeah. I'll answer yes. Any other questions? So if not, that's the four four things you do want to take away. So you're going to be here for the whole day. So come talk to us about how if you're using a credit, if you're doing machine learning, and you have data that you're working on so far, 
you already have access to future-proof infrastructure. Compared to anybody else doing it outside, you can do it you know, way faster than everybody else can. You can do it at a reduced cost of curiosity because Charlie was mentioning how we scale well. Usually scaling well means we bring down the, uh, the, uh, the, the amount of time to provide a new hypothesis. So if a, if a model training takes four days, we're going to be training 15 minutes on a credit. So by the time you go grab coffee in your back, the model is training your resistance. It's going to take four days training your thumbs. Like I said, there's plenty of opportunity in science, especially on credit, what we know beyond metrics data and beyond what we do with scientific data, to create new models of tomorrow that don't exist today and be creative about using those shapes of data. And we'd love to work with you guys on it. So with that, I'll thank you all again and appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys. Looking forward to more conversations. Okay, so I'd like to thank Rangan and Charles for a really interesting introduction to some of the examples that you have worked on. And I think a lot of them are very relevant to the research that's going on in New Zealand. Currently, my voice isn't loud enough. <laughs> um, and um, I think also um, the research that is going to be presented in the next yeah, session you know, does relate quite a lot to um, what you've spoken about. So you've you put the right buttons there. Um, and so are there any further questions? So we do have another 10 minutes or so if you do have further questions. I have a question linking back to um, the short-term weather predictions. And so it's basically like a 10% improvement if you ran the machine learning versus just being a human head looked out the window. I was kind of like wondering, how do you then scale the cost of all that computing versus a 10% improvement? Is, is that enough to be worth it, do you think? So, so thought we have a, no, no, maybe not at this deck, but you know, the back of the deck. So I'll give you the number in the enterprise world, and you can you can extrapolate it to science and make it valuable or not. And that depends on, on how you interpret it, right? So what you've seen so far is when your model complexity increases by 20x between AlexNet to ResNet, the computational requirements increase 16 times. So number of parameters multiplied by 20, the computer requirements were multiplied by 16, they got 13% increase in accuracy. It was worth it, way worth it, right? They made billions of dollars doing that, right? So that was valuable. It's the same model, but twice the number of data points. So if you took a same model, double the size of data you feed into it, it required five times to converge, but produced only 3% increase in, uh, in revenue, and 3% increase in accuracy. That also produced a billion dollars, right, for these speech. So, so it's, it's, it's which, whichever way you want to think about, right? So if you know the ROI, if you know the value of the problem, and every increase, increment in your success, time to accuracy kind of thing matters, then it, it's value. But if you're doing a one-time experiment, then you probably should have presented a different approach to how we can help you with that as well. So you've got these hyperparameter optimization frameworks where if you don't know the model space well enough, and you don't care about accuracy as much, but you always want to have a guarantee of the best model with a certain variance about best accuracy, then you've got this tool called Evo Devo that comes with our next version of uh, the play software, which lets you design an arbitrary template and it'll tell you the best trained accuracy for that particular template of the model that you can achieve with it. And it'll, it'll train you to that model. Right? So it's, it's a tunable parameter if you have a query. Right? If you have access to 400 GPUs, you can run 400 models on parallel. So that's kind of the trick that it's doing. But yeah, to answer your question, that's a user input rather than a, than a, than a compute, compute model. So that's sort of moving into that combinatorial pattern that exactly. you talked about. Yeah. So. So it's an evolutionary algorithm and again the search space is, is combinatorial there. So, right. Yeah. And it's in the, so the combinatorial space is now happening on the parameters of your deep learning model. Right. Right. And so right. the space of the model itself. Yeah. yeah. So I guess my question is um, what's next after deep learning? Reinforcement learning. Right. It's coming in the big time. Right? Deep so, learning's not done yet. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good answer. Yeah. That's a much better answer. Yeah, the answer is deep learning's not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this so, but reinforcement learning is just going to use other ML techniques and could use deep learning. Yes. So it's it's more how do we apply things that we know. So, so the way I, at least from, I'll give you a great perspective on it. Yep. So, Craig's been traditionally used for simulations. Yes. Right? So we've always, we've always known the forward problem really well. Reinforcement learning has a similar flavor to it. So you're always in simulation space also. Right? Yes. So you're saying, I'm in a 3D world that I have to walk through. I want to learn how to walk. But I'm a robot, I want to lift things, I want to work against gravity, figure out how gravity works. I want to see a pendulum oscillate, what should eventually start, what should be my period, time period, and so forth. That's where the reinforcement problems are. 
And what you're going to see going forward is this idea of having cognitive simulations where HPC and AI emerge, especially for the scientific space. Right? So where the AI starts feeding the, uh, the simulation, and the simulation is starting to feed AI, and they start to work together. Right. So we have that. That's the last slide, and I want to talk about it. You guys have a chance where we talk about learning inside, learning outside, and learning on the side. So this is what is coming up next. Right. This is, this is thinking about how do, we, how do I, if I have machine learning models, how do I embed it into my existing app? If I'm doing molecular simulations, can I make my simulation smarter? Learning outside is saying, my simulation is doing something over here. I'm trying to understand something from my experiment over here. My experiment is using AI to drive, this, drive the, uh, the instruments. My simulation is trying to validate my AI. So can we all work and work together? Learning on the side is saying, there should be actually one more. Come up over there. Yeah. <laughs> so you have, you have multiple simulations running. And can I, can I be smarter on the ensemble of uh, simulations that I'm running and, and get, get better at doing it and work closer? So the little one, sort of like a feedback loop, and then... The steering loop, the feedback loop, and automation loop, yeah. yeah. Okay, any further questions? So I think I've got one about reproducibility. So um, if we were to use something that's... I'm still kind of trying to understand quite how things work, but if there was a, a Cray... Oh, thanks. If there's a, a Cray-specific sort of um, bit of kit, that you could use to do some awesome stuff very quickly. That's really great. But then, would that then mean if I was to then publish the output of that work, someone would also need the Cray system to then check and reproduce that? Is it just like a computer that works really, really, really fast? So, or would there be a bit sort of a breakdown there? So, I'm going to answer that on two different levels. The first okay. level at the code level, right? So, if you're writing code and you're saying my code works on a laptop, and you just get on a Cray, we're not there yet. But within like less than 10 percent of code change, it should work on most. If you're using the most recent toolkits and so forth, that should work just fine. And for the reproducibility aspects of it, we've adopted this container strategy, where we're saying if you're developing inside a Docker or a container on your laptop and you're deploying it wherever you want to, be the query, be the cloud, be wherever, that's the next stage of scalable compute that you have access to. Containers world would work just fine on a query going forward. And so we have a shifters now. A shifter is a container package that, that we support, but then going forward, you should have support for uh, Docker images. So you should be able to convert Docker images into a images and work on a query and so forth. So in terms of level of effort, it's about, I would say, depending on the, the complexity of code, a few hours, or maybe even less. Jim can, uh, going from arbitrary code to making it work on a query and be able to report it and so forth. That's at the, at, the, at, the, at the software level where you write your own code, you want your own environments. If you're using existing deep learning toolkits and so forth, so we have what we call the Cray plugin. Right? The reason we call it a plugin is that it'll work on your normal laptop, it just won't be performant enough. It'll work on the cloud, it just won't be performant enough. But you put in our plugin, on a Cray, it's going to run 95% scalability efficiency compared to everybody else. Right? So that's the second level of reproducibility uh, where we give you the functionality on a Cray, but take it away when you go outside. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and the third one is more algorithmic. I think techniques are still not mature in that sense. So if you picked a model, and you're saying, here's my model, I trained it at work. And unless you're able to share that model with somebody else, and they, they want to reproduce it, I don't think deep learning or machine learning is mature enough to do that today. Where even if we give you everything, I give you my entire data set, and you bring the retraining, your models are not going to look the same. Right? So that reproducibility is a different problem. Uh, if you fix all the random seeds properly, and that's tricky itself, <laughs> and, you're work and if you're working on a CPU, then it's usually reproducible. GPU threading is comp is less deterministic. Oh, oh, sorry, I was going to say I would probably argue that if you if you happen to publish a paper based on one individual model that you trained that happened to do super, super duper well, that's probably not going to cut it in the scientific world. Anyway, yeah, you're going to have to want to do multiple you, times. Yeah, generally you do like fivefold cross validation and you report or and you report with bars. Yeah. So it's going to be hard with this one. And I saw somebody present uh, how the, the size of the model itself has increased so much in the last few days that you can't even share anymore. So academic Torrance doesn't want to host deep learning models anymore, right? So there's all these discussions that have been really recently where the models are getting to be gigabytes. There was a biggest 400 gigabyte model that somebody uploaded for some scientific use case. Why would you keep a model that's 400 gigabytes? And if it's getting updated every day, you have to make multiple copies to do the model management itself, right? So that's, that's like five times the size of your data almost. Something. Another aspect of reproducibility is that, uh, except for the Cray Graph Engine, um, all of the packages that we offer are all open source. 
And of course, the versions are there and everything like that. So if someone else wished to reproduce your work, they could certainly get access to the same versions of the same open source packages. Um, within the Cray world, of course, we, we, we save all the previous containers. And so if you wanted to go back and rerun your results um, a year from now, you can simply load an earlier version that would have all the, you know, we do, we do keep up with the open source packages, but um, all of the previous containers are available as modules, and you can go back and, and get exact reproduction. Yeah, outside of Chris, uh, what does it keep like? Sure, sure. Um, I've got a question about model validation. Yeah, I've got a okay. very quick one about model um, validation. I'd like to thank our speakers once again. And now I'm going to hand over to Thomas Lumley, who will MC the second part of the meeting. Thanks. So now we have uh, three presentations from local researchers, uh, followed by a um, question and answer session for them, and then some general discussion at the end. So the first of our local speakers is Dr. Jane Allison who um, is originally a local, did her honours degree with uh, Julia Gerard, and uh, went to Cambridge and various other postdocs, ETH Zurich, and is now a relevant uh, discovery fellow. And she's going to talk about a sort of early stage in this um, HBC framework. So we're going to have sort of people talking about being in different stages of the process of using these high performance computing tools. And Um, yeah, this is very, very early stage. So I'm standing here as someone who's could have heard of that machine and has a vague idea of what it could achieve and has absolutely no idea how to actually use it. Um, so what I was going to do is give a bit of an intro to my field and the kinds of models that we use and areas where I think they might be provable through machine learning. Um, and I guess it'll be really interesting with Q&A if anyone has a much better idea than me of how that might actually happen. Um, so I work on molecular simulation, usually biological molecules. Um, this is a very small example. Um, normally we're looking at things that have many thousands of atoms, um, and so they're much bigger and much more complicated, which is why you can't really think about it and you need a computer model. Um, and so why would we even bother simulating? Why not just, you know, do lab experiments? Um, and so for me, there's sort of some, some reasons why we want to remarkably do it. And so one is that we can simultaneously access a whole lot of different information. Um, so we can get structural information, so much as you might get from a, a crystal structure, which would be the traditional way to study a lot of these molecules. So you can get really detailed um, the description of where all your atoms are in three-dimensional space. And you can visualize them very nicely because obviously your, your model is already on the computer. Um, but also you don't just get a single structure, you get ensembles of structure. You get all the possible structures that could be formed. So you can start to look at distributions. You can start to ask questions about what tends to happen in different situations rather than just having one snapshot in front of you. Um, and so the reason why we've got these ensembles is because we get dynamic information. So the particular simulations I run tend to run time-dependent sampling rather than, say, random sampling. So we're actually getting some information about process and mechanism, which is something I really appreciate to help me to understand how the biology might actually be working. Um, so we can look at how all those atoms move around with respect to time. Um, and that, for instance, things like protein folding would be the classic reason why people thought they'd like to do these simulations and we still can't really do that. Um, and then the third thing is you also get thermodynamic information. So we can probe the energetics of the system. So not just where does everything go, but how favorable were those different structures and processes. Uh, so we can get energies, we can get free energies as well if we put in a lot of effort. Um, and that can help you talk about how favorable the situation is. So things like um, drug binding or ligand binding to a protein would be really important to understand, not just the process by which it happens, but how likely it is to happen. Um, and you can also do all sorts of things that you couldn't do in real life, so unphysical or totally inaccessible states. So we can do things like make atoms soft and squishy or disappear them. Um, you can study all sorts of things that would be far too dangerous to do in a lab as well. And this, I like this analogy for probe, probe hypotheses that you couldn't test in real life at all um, and, and try to understand that it might be why something was happening. Um, and so when we, I was going to start talking through the kinds of decisions and things that we have to think about when we start building a model of some, some molecules. These are the kinds of things I'll be asking people when they come to me and say, can you model this? Um, so there's a bunch of decisions that we have to go through. So 
the one that maybe the first is, or one of the, one of many is, what are the sort of elementary particles, the units that we're going to move around? Um, and so there's different, lots of different levels at which you can model a molecule. Um, so there's some very, very high accuracy ones. So these up here will be more in the realm of quantum chemistry. Um, and then down here is more uh, classical chemistry, more where I tend to hang out. Uh, I put the accuracy, I know it sort of starts again through the medium, um, that's because here I think I'm dealing with accuracy within the quantum realm, and here I'm dealing with accuracy in the classical realm. Uh, but what you see is that the number of atoms that you can cope with uh, is, is, depends on the level of theory which you're trying to describe. So up here, we, these are methods that try to figure out where all the electrons are. Uh, that makes it a lot more expensive. Um, so the very most accurate ones you might only get to about 20 atoms, so you can look at very, very small molecules. Um, the, the less accurate methods you could get up to about 2,000, so maybe a very, very small protein. Um, and if you want to start looking at, at proteins and large collections of biological molecules, you can't afford to deal with electrons anymore. Um, and so we use what we call all atom or even coarser sort of multiple atoms become blob models, um, and these are a lot cheaper. The other thing I looked at here is time evolution. So you can look at time evolution in the quantum realm, but again, that's quite very rarely done because it becomes even more expensive. Um, whereas at atomic levels, so every atom being an individual blob, not worrying about electrons, time evolution is pretty much standard. Um, and so you can you can ask different questions and probe different systems with these kinds of models than you can with the more accurate quantum models. So my yeah, so this is this is the realm which I'm working. Um, and so for us, generally speaking, our elementary particles are atoms. Sometimes we can use cruder models, but that'll be our, our default um, setting. And then we're going to think, well, what can we afford, given that we're going to deal with the level of atoms being my smallest unit, what can I afford to put into my simulation? And also, what do I need to have in there to, to answer, the right, answer the questions I'm asking? And how do I deal with the edges? So I'm going beyond what I can afford to put in there. Because if you just sort of have walls, that's maybe not very realistic. Does my protein exist in the cell with a wall around it? Probably not. Um, so we tend to use a trick called periodic boundary conditions. Um, and just briefly, it works out like this. But this would be the system that we're actually interested in. And we just replicate it. In all dimensions, this is a 2D version of it, and if it moves out one side of the system, it just reappears on the other side. Um, this is a nice trick to avoid having to have walls, it avoids having vacuum around the outside. Um, the bits that I'm interested in here behave as if they're in just a bigger space that's pretty much uniform in all directions. Um, so that's the most common trick that we would use. Um, we've also got to figure out how we're going to move all of our atoms or particles around, because we want to look at their time evolution, not just get a snapshot of them. Um, and just very, very hand wavily for every possible position of all the atoms, which I'm not going to call the structure, there's going to be some associated potential energy saying whether or not that's a very happy arrangement of the atoms. A nice, well-folded protein, for instance, is going to be quite a low energy state. Other arrangements might have higher energy. Um, so we're going to be able to move around on this energy landscape, but we're going to end up spending most time in the low energy states and how far we get is going to depend a bit on how long we can afford to run our simulation for. So we're exploring sort of the potential energy space of um, different arrangements of the atoms, and we effectively do this, and not going to do the details, but by taking little, little tiny moves of the atoms, um, and, and so we're moving very, very slowly across the surface. But what I really want to focus on was um, how our particles interact, because this is the design of the model that we put in, and this is the bit where I think machine learning might be able to help us. Um, so how are our atoms or our particles, how do they know how to interact with each other? How do we sort of program in that chemistry? Um, so as I said, ideally we'd want to worry about where all the electrons are. Um, that would be sort of getting from the truest representation of the underlying chemistry. Um, that would be trying to evaluate the wave function. Um, even really approximate methods are going to be way, way too expensive for something the size of a protein. Um, so this is only like the first two layers are chopped off like most of that image. Um, maybe put on my slide, this is just for a hydrogen atom, and there's already a huge amount of mass that goes into all the possible places where an electron might be hanging out around a hydrogen atom. So we're not going to do that. Um, so, and also the other reason, now that these are just two examples of methods for trying to figure out where all the electrons might go. Um, basis set is kind of the number of fundamental functions you've got in there. There's not, it's the scale somewhere between the number of atoms and the number of electrons surrounding that atom, um, and we've got huge powers on there. So, by the beginning, the number of atoms, as the number of atoms goes up, the number of basis sets goes up even faster, and then we've got cubes to six powers, depending on how fancy your method is. You can't afford to do this, and then you've got to think about doing that at lots of points in time. So, we're using what's called classical force spheres, where we just ignore the electrons altogether, and we're going to link the energy of a system just to the position 
But the new cloud has anything so this is what we need to worry about is nowhere in the middle of the atom is um, in space, in three dimensional space. So how do we actually sort of put this in? Um, so we have a bunch of actually relatively simple mathematical terms that tell us about the chemistry of the atoms and how they might interact. So the first one I'm going to put in here is what we've, it's called a Leonard-Jones function, but it, want, it mimics Van der Waals dispersion interactions. This is what happens when two atoms get quite close to each other. So along here I'm mapping the distance between two atoms, and this curve just shows me the potential energy associated with them being that distance apart. Low numbers are good, so the low energy states are better. So when they're really far apart, two atoms basically can't, they don't really care, there's no energy between them. As they come closer together, we get a depth, a minimum in the potential energy. They quite like to hang out about that distance apart, but if you try to push them closer together, we shoot up with very positive energies, and that basically says that, as we know, we can't put two atoms in the same place, at least not in any kind of normal condition. Um, so there's, there's a mathematical function here that computes that, but we're just looking at a function as a, as a function of the distance between two atoms, and we only ever deal with pairwise interactions, because otherwise, again, it becomes computationally intractable. Um, but that was just kind of saying these, these are sort of generally atoms, we haven't said too much about the nature of them. We've ignored electrons, but we know that some atoms are going to be more likely to draw electrons towards them and might have some negative charge. Other types of atoms are more likely to give up their electrons and have some positive charge. So we give actually just fractional charges to our atoms, so like plus 0.4, minus 0.6, which is not quite a whole electron, it just says you tend to grab electrons or you tend to give them away. And again, we map according to the distance between two atoms and the charges on them we can compute an energy term. This is if a negatively charged atom is closer to a positively charged one, that becomes very favorable energy. But this will always win. This goes up almost vertically, so you can never still put two atoms in the same place. These are like general purpose atoms hanging around, bumping into each other, how they like to interact. But we've got a molecule we know a little bit more about it at the start that we can also plug in. Um, so we know which atoms are actually covalently bonded to each other. And under, under the conditions that we simulate, those bonds are not going to break. Uh, so we can put that in as additional information. So we have a bond stretching term, which is literally just a little harmonic spring, that says that they're going to, they're going to be a certain length of the bond between those atoms that's most favourable. It can vibrate a little bit, but it's not going to shoot out here, and also not going to squish together too much. Um, so we have again just on the distance between two bonded atoms, we have a little harmonic term. We can do the same thing for angles, so that's what's shown up here. That there'll be, according to all the underlying chemistry, some preferred angle between three atoms. It can flex a little bit, but it's not going to completely change that angle. And then the last term we have is what's shown here by something rotating. It's actually sort of spinning around, rotating around that bond. Um, and so we have our periodic functions that can go on there. With, we can add lots of periodic functions on if we want something a bit more complicated. Again, telling us which positions around there most favorably. Uh, most favorable according to underlying chemistry. So these are the basic terms that go into almost every classical molecular force field that's ignored electrons, working at the level of atoms, and trying to describe how those atoms like to move around and be with respect to each other. Uh, so there's some slight differences, but generally speaking, most force fields use something very much like these terms. And so how do we get, to, well, I want to point out, there's a lot of parameters in here. So RAJ is always the distance between two things, that's going to change during my simulation. But all these other symbols in here are parameter values that we need to figure out what they should be for every possible pair of atoms. So there's quite a lot of parameter values that need to go into making these things describe chemistry realistically. And so historically this has been empirically pretty much just manually optimised. Um, so usually a bunch of four PhD students and postdocs spending an awful lot of time tweaking parameter values and seeing if then when they simulate a bunch of molecules they can reproduce experimental or quantum chemical data. Um, so yeah, first thing is experimental data, usually that's more bulk scale data or perhaps spectroscopic data for bond lengths. Um, and then I guess um, it's become more feasible to run a lot of quantum calculations on small molecules. We can get electronic structure calculations and then use these to inform the next layer up of modeling. Um, so generally speaking, again, keep it tractable for these poor humans, but it would separately optimize the bonded parameters, so the geometrical ones versus the non-bonded sort of general 3D space interaction ones. And probably only subsets of these at a time, again, because you kind of, as a human, trying to manually tweak all these things. And so it seemed to me that machine learning methods could allow us to do this a lot smarter, a lot faster, at a lot bigger scale. Um, so it could be simultaneously be optimizing a lot of these different parameter values. So of course, if you change one, it's going to change the appropriate space for another set of parameters. Um, and I'll hopefully also automate that so there isn't any more poor PhD students and postdocs um, having to do that. 
Um, so that's, that's one area. The other area, kind of thinking a bit deeper, is that all those mathematical terms that we use to describe the interactions, there's some quite good historical reasons why those are used. Um, so it's, some, it's a balance between trying to accurately represent the underlying physics and chemistry versus having something that we could actually calculate fast enough to do this on the fly. Um, and so, of course, when people started building these models in the late 70s and early 80s, the speed of computers was very different to what it is now. Um, so one example is this term that we use to describe this interactions purely on a distance dependence. Um, it's built around, basically, this distance here is because of the 12th and 6th power, we're always looking at um, that distance squared and then various higher powers of that. And that's because the distance, when you're trying to compute the distance between add two atoms in the calculation, you first get to the square of the distance and then you'd have to square root it if you wanted the actual distance. Square roots were expensive, so they could build a formula based on powers of two. That was going to be much, much faster to calculate. And if it's, you know, once you've got your sixth power, you've easily got your twelfth power. And so again, it was a very fast to calculate and it did a good enough job. Um, but there's no reason why these mathematical terms are the best possible ones. Or even conceptualizing things as atoms and doing everything pairwise according to the distance, is that the best way to model it? I don't know. It was something that humans thought made sense. Um, so this is really way out there. I don't know how this would work, but can machine learning provide a route to different architectures of these force fields, different ways of saying, well, we can't deal with electrons, but how should we reconfigure things? What should our units be? How should units interact? Should they be able to change on the fly during the simulation? Um, and so, Looking around in the literature, people have been playing around with this. Um, and you say in the last 15, almost 20 years, um, and mostly they've been using genetic algorithms in force field development, um, and, but mostly just for sort of not for everything all at once. So just sort of fitting or reparameterizing some of the terms. There's some examples of the, the, the dihedral, the, the angle terms. So this is the this general atoms coming closer parameters, atomic probabilities, abilities, and also building some different types of models. Um, using genetic algorithms. Um, there's lots of just been really ad hoc force field, just in parameter optimizations as well. But there's not been any kind of big wholesale optimization, and there's also, as far as I can tell, mostly just been genetic algorithms. So there's probably a whole lot of other more sophisticated methods out there that are maybe worth trying. Um, but thinking a bit more about this, you know, it all sounds really exciting, but is it action feasible? Is there a really good reason why people haven't done this? So the thing about the bottlenecks, I think actually finding the training and test data and the scale of data that's needed, given relative to the number of parameters we might want to optimize, this may well be an insurmountable problem, I don't know. Um, but you know, if we want to optimize multiple parameters in parallel, we're going to need extensive training data. Quantum mechanical calculations of that data, we could potentially generate that ourselves. Uh, that would be expensive to run all those calculations first. Um, if you want to use experimental data, perhaps it's going to require some text mining because not all of it is available in friendly databases. Some of it's going to be buried in historical publications that may be only available in PDF format if you're lucky. But there are some online databases, so I think you want to start with seeing what you get out of there. Um, so a lot of these are going to be associated with existing automated parameterization efforts. So there's one that we use quite a lot, the Automated Topology Builder, that has quite a nice database already of things where they will really calculate the atomic the electron structure. Things where they've already calculated so much communities and we've got the experimental data here as well. So then there's places where you can start and to make the problem practical. Whether it would actually be applicable wholesale, I don't know. Um, so that's one. One is the data, and two is then calculating the properties from your molecules when you've just optimized your parameters to compare back to that data. Because some of those calculations, some of those properties are also quite expensive, unfortunately. Um, and so I want well, to not touch on that a bit later. So how are we even going to test? All these new parameters that we've come up with. Um, so as well as just comparing to data, we might want to try to predict the outcome of experiments um, that can distinguish between correct versus incorrect sets of parameters. Um, so if we've got whole molecules, can we just predict, say, a ground state structure of it, a low energy structure? Um, if you can just get there through energy minimization, it's pretty cheap. If we have to actually sample whole lots of different structures to find the lowest energy one, got more expensive again. Can we predict some experimental stuff like NMR observables? Um, again, good predictions might actually require quite a lot of computer effort before we can test our parameters. Um, if we've maybe got small, small whole molecules or maybe just little fragments of them, this is where a lot of the force field development has traditionally worked here. So maybe like solvation for energies and different solvents. This tells you about how much that molecule likes water versus other solvents. And because there's a lot of uh, experimental data to compare against here. 
uh, but they're very expensive calculations. There may be some tricks how far that they usually these tricks are only applicable if you may notice small changes to your parameters. If you completely redesign your model, you can't use the tricks anymore. Uh, the same goes for finding affinities between different molecules. Um, if you've got pure lipids, again, this is where a lot of force field parameterization has, has originally worked because there was a lot of experimental data, but only certain molecules will exist in liquid form. There's a whole lot of other thermodynamic properties, some of which are a little bit cheaper to compute. But you simply recompute them every time you change your parameter set. And so I think this is going to be also potentially a big bottleneck. We know how to do all of these things. They just take compute time in figuring out if, that's, if we can do that fast enough to make it worthwhile using machine learning. Is, uh, I don't know. It's something we have to explore. And so where to start? Um, so I think, you know, just looking at, rather than trying to redesign the force field, I'll certainly start off with looking at parameter reoptimization. Um, and looking to do that simultaneously across the board by the, the, the small subsets, as has been done so far. And I think you want to start with a limited set of molecules, so maybe some common solvents. Again, where there's lots of data, there's lots of examples, there's maybe some reasonable guesses at initial parameter sets that we can start from. Um, and, and again, liquids that represent common functional groups that show up in lots of different molecules. But if you can get those right, you've probably got a good baseline for lots of other um, molecules as well. So you can initiate with existing force field parameter values, that's one option, but I'm worried that we're stuck in a really odd small corner of parameter value space, because that's where humans landed, and there might be some other much better areas that we're not getting to. But maybe machine learning will let us jump over to those areas in a way that humans are not really very good at. <coughs> um, and yet again, we want to look at the situations we can get, on hopefully a lot of tests and training data from published older force field parameterization efforts. So yes, that's the far I got. As I said, it's very perspective. I've just been thinking around about what we might be able to do in our field. Um, I'm kind of hoping to get something out today about how feasible this really is. Okay. So we've got as I said, we've got time for um, discussion, questions and answers, and then discussion at the end. So we'll go on to our next presentation, which is from Chris Print. So uh, Chris started off as a what we don't call a real doctor in universities, uh, and uh, then, then became interested in bioinformatics and genomics. And he's um, among his physicians. He was uh, director of the Auckland Bioinformatics Institute at the University of Auckland uh, for a while. Was involved in the New Zealand genomics, um, and so he has a long a history of sort of genomic bioinformatics interests. So he, and he's going to talk us about the sort of next stage in this process of using HPC. Well, thank you, Thomas, and thank you. Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yeah, th thank you for inviting me to speak. I really have a bit of imposter syndrome here in that I'm looking in from the outside. I know a little bit about modeling. I'm more interested in what the models can produce for patients and for my understanding of disease than I am in the modeling. So I'm hoping, like uh, Jane, from today to get out an idea of what can actually be done in my area. And I'm grateful for the Nessie and uh, Craig people here. So the, the brief that uh, Nick Jones gave me was to really discuss the growth areas for AI and health with some example... Uh, okay. If I turn it on, that would help. Sorry. <laughs> So, so this is the brief that gave me example use cases, highlighting opportunities in the context of New Zealand's research and clinical infrastructure, and really talking about how skills, workflows, platform changes will uh, facilitate this. So one of the reasons to do this in New Zealand is that we've had a recent relatively large investment of $35 million called Genomics Aotearoa. And this supports genomics and bioinformatics across health, primary industries and the environment. It's a partnership between a large range of organisations with a close associations with NESI. And as part of Genomics ATRO, as I said, there is this health team. And every part of this health team, I imagine, AI is very applicable to. One of the projects is developing a vario or a map of genetic variation for New Zealanders. At present, if I'm looking at the sequence of an individual or an individual's tumour, if that individual is Māori or it is a Pacific person, I have less certainty about the meaning of the variance I see in that person's sequence because there's been less research done on it. So the idea of developing a New Zealand variant 
the idea of working closely with Māori to develop models of how to use genomics. The use of AI may be very interesting to many Māori researchers, I know it is. The idea of epigenome-wide association study pipelines, a project I'm driving, New Zealand-focused pipelines to analyse genetic variation in cancer, new tests to track pathogens that ESR is involved in. All of these, I think, are grist for the mill for AI and potentially could work with prey. Around the country, we have these close associations between clinical people and research people. And this is one example that Justin O'Sullivan and I lead in Auckland called Genomics into Medicine, which is a strategic research initiative in the university really designed to bring these two groups closer with quite a lot of funding over three years. Once again, brings opportunities for using these technologies that haven't yet been grabbed. So this is my version of what I see the real examples as potential growth areas for AI in New Zealand <coughs> research and healthcare. Medical diagnostics, including genomics, path imaging, and using large-scale medical data, drug discovery, and medical treatment, especially around automated treatment pipelines and personalised medicine. I'll give a few examples of each of these from what we regard as best in world practice, but also from what's probably worst in world practice from our own research group, as we're just starting to try and grapple with this data. First of all, a few examples in genomics. So, we believe, like many of you, I guess, that most of the best science today involves reusing other people's data, as data becomes increasingly available. And we're certainly taking this approach. We're very interested in how the immune system and cancer cells interact in the body. This is largely driven by the advent of immune checkpoint inhibitor drugs that boost the immune system and stop cancer cells inhibiting the function of the immune system. So with the help of Messi and the Centre for E-Research here, we've downloaded a massive data set from the cancer, um, from Worldwide Cancer Consortium. It's about 2.5 petabytes of data. We've not been able to store it. So we've had to download it, process it, pull out immune information, mutational information, clinical information from each tumour, and then dump it, and then download the next one. We'd love to be able to use this data that we're very privileged to have permission to access in a much more sensible way to understand the relationship between immune cells and cancer cells. Using other people's data and then putting our own data in the context of it. The other point I really wanted to raise is the power of competition. As university professors, we're all a little bit competitive, right? And I think competition really drives some of the best algorithms, especially if you have a single data set, and then you have a bake-off between different methods. And obviously, the Kaggle organisation and the competitions and organisers have been very powerful in this regard. And this is a genomic analysis Kaggle competition that finished relatively recently. And the idea of this was to um, classify RNA sequencing data to identify different types of tissue. Another competition that we've observed and downloaded the data from but kind of lurked and not really taken part due to probably lack of confidence, to be honest, is the Precision FDA Challenge. And this is a fantastic challenge where there is a um, tumour, an uncharacterised tumour sample, and groups compete to use machine learning, learning algorithms to best classify the tumour. One of the fascinating things that came out of this was an approach called Deep Variant from Google Brain was used, and it actually won the competition, I think, in 2016. The idea of this is you take DNA mutational information and you represent it visually, much like we would clinically or in science, where we stack up all of the DNA reads, so each of these horizontal lines is a DNA sequence read, and we colour those DNA sequence reads according to what type of mutation it is. Is it what we'd expect from the reference genome, the normal sequence, or is it a substitution of a base like these green fluorescent dots? Is it a deletion of one or two copies like you see here? Is it a deletion of both copies like you see here? Or is it just really messy DNA sequence where there's so many sequencing errors that we can't get anything out of? This won the competition by converting the DNA sequences into images and then using the really well-developed image analysis methods 
in deep learning, um, cognitive confidence to really look at this. Now, did this do so well? Because actually, by converting the data into images, you are really getting rid of the noise and identifying the signal. Or did it just work well because we still have to catch up in our learning methods, machine learning methods, to deal with anything that's not an image? And I'd like to ask that question maybe this afternoon. We've had our own internal bake-offs, and this is an example. One of the fun things about being a group leader is that you, you, part of your responsibility, I reckon, is to keep on trying everything new, which is a lot of fun. This was simply an idea to try and identify whether breast cancer patients survived for five years or not. That's quite an important clinical point when you're seeing a patient in the clinic. We did this using RNA sequencing data. The old-fashioned way we do it is to use the adaptive lasso to select features and then use logistic regression. And I always used to say to my students, if you can't see it with logistic regression, it isn't there. But I'm starting to think that that may not be right. So this is how much we have to learn in this. By using um, TensorFlow through Kerasinar, using a very, very simple model, which I'm, I had to think quite a lot about putting it up because I'm very embarrassed about this. We're beginners, and this is probably a mere cult for showing how beginners we are. But even using such a simple model, we were able to generate reasonable RUC curves. The, the area under the curve is not quite what we get with logistic regression, but that really enthused us. We've since got a slightly better models using the XG Boost package in Keras using gradient boosting. We're very green though. We don't know how to optimise models. We don't know what type of regularisation we is the best way to reduce overfitting. We don't know how much K-fold cross-validation to do when they're building the models. All of these things we'd love to learn about. Here's another potential AI opportunity that we are very interested in. We're doing a lot of DNA sequencing at present of blood of cancer patients. The idea is that tumours lose some of their DNA containing mutations into the blood and we can detect that and therefore we can follow disease and identify response to treatment. And this is an example in melanoma patients. We've done DNA sequencing of their blood. We've identified a mutation in the BRAF gene and we've seen that mutation fall as the patient has been treated with these immune checkpoint inhibitor drugs that turn on the immune system to fight the tumour. Here's an example of another patient though where unfortunately the tumour has progressed through treatment with the same drugs. And you can see on the CT scans, the small tumours getting larger. And the number of molecules per mil, that, uh, of mutant DNA molecules per mil, increases over time through these different treatment strategies. So we're getting large amounts of this data now. How can we use AI to better detect information about patients' progression on treatment? Can we actually combine this with imaging studies, with lots of electronic health records, with other information about the patient? to much better figure out what's going on. Another opportunity that we're really struggling with in our group is that we are very interested in how tumours evolve in patients. So we've a number of very brave patients who've agreed that on their natural death we can do a rapid autopsy. And some of these patients will have 90, 100 tumours. This is a particular patient with a neuroendocrine tumour who is a patient of my close colleague, colleague Ben Lawrence. And Tamsin Robin, our group, has used a variety of traditional evolution modelling methods with Lexi Drummond in this university to try and model how all of these different tumours have evolved in the patient. And using these traditional models, we find a set of mutations that all of the tumours maintain, but we find these three or four different lineages. And these are all really important clinically because each of the different lineages will have different sensitivities and resistance to different drug or radiotherapies. We'd like to use artificial intelligence to much better model the evolution of the tumours and maybe in real patients where we have biopsies of numbers of the tumours as well as blood samples that reflect all of the different tumour DNA in the blood, we'd like to better model what the different tumours are like in the patient, therefore what the combinations or sequence of chemotherapies and targeted therapies we can give to the patient should be. We don't know how well AI could work in this, but we'd love to give it a go. So I just want to very, very quickly go through other areas that I think have already been highlighted today, and I'll skip a few slides for sake of speed. Pathological imaging, we think, is a very important area. We're just starting to dip our toe into this area. 
Um, the idea, obviously, is that you have an image, for example, of a tumour, and trying to identify what that tumour is, it's very hard for a pathologist. First of all, you have a big tumour, you're looking at a microscope slide, you're sampling very, very tiny fractions of the tumour. But obviously, with machine learning, a machine can look at large areas of tumour on a large number of slides and have a much more complete analysis, perhaps identifying the area that the pathologist should focus on. There's a number of different algorithms and patterns out there that you already know of. For example, looking for breast cancer metastasis. Um, there's a very interesting competition that once again we're lurking on and quietly ourselves using the data to try and optimise methods called the TUPAC challenge, where a large pathology group has put up a large number of breast cancer um, images as training sets trying to identify tumours in those images. Once again, the CAM competition has come to the rescue here. One of the things we've realised as we start to try and model using AI pathology is that the simplest things are really hard. In some images, for example, we're not identifying nuclei as well. The nuclei of a cell have to be identified because that's really important in identifying the state of a cell. Hence this quite um, high value prize uh, CAM competition with over 700 teams completed this year, just to even try and find the nuclei. We, we talked about trying to beat humans, or Ronan run, run, talked about beating humans, actually we're trying to beat pigeons. <laughs> if you think about it, pigeons have evolved to have fantastic pattern recognition as they fly. They have to process very quickly a lot of information just to keep alive, obviously. And they turn out, well, they turn out to not be that bad at recognising the things that happen. <laughs> um, very quickly, the whole growth area in New Zealand through the Precision Health Initiative and a large number of other initiatives that we look on and admire in using um, public data and patient data, the idea of social media data to identify adverse drug reactions, the idea of anaesthetists being able to free up their time while we're dealing with patients during operations by having a AI models automatically adjust the dose of propofol, the dose of anaesthetic agent. Um, we already heard a little bit about detecting skin cancer more accurately than doctors from images of skin. The idea of diagnosing tuberculosis where in remote regions you don't have very skilled radiologists but the AI can at least identify images that need to then be transmitted to a remote radiologist to look at. And once again, the capital competition and other competitions are honing the skills in this area. This is a particularly difficult challenge of identifying pneumonia from chest x-rays. It's actually really hard to spot any pneumonia, but then it becomes obvious later. So clearly that's crystal for the normal for AI once again. And of course, uh, really bring this down to devices, it's really important to make it move into practice. The idea of um, Apple's research kit and care kit uh, facilitating some of that reduction of practice. So I'm going to actually skip the next few slides because of time and some of them have already been discussed. Just one, one thing I wanted to mention though is that we still think very strongly that we need to start simple and then move complex where we have to. This is a very good example of that. We, we wanted to identify new oncogenes or new genes and mutations that drive cancer in breast cancer. We, done, we did that by getting RNA expression analysis, whole genome analysis from a little bit over a thousand tumours. Then we tried to build two sorts of models. First of all, on my laptop, built very simple correlation models. We were looking at the correlation between all of the genes and all of the tumours. The second sort of model was through a wonderful collaboration I have with uh, Professor Satoru Miyano in Tokyo, using complex Bayesian network technologies where we changed this into a graph problem using these splines to model the interaction between all of these thousand, or all of these um, 18,000 odd, odd genes or RNAs across a thousand tumours. Using simple Spearman's correlation, about five lines in my laptop in R, seemed to do the job just as well in this particular case as the much more complicated model. And it helped us identify a gene where most of the genes are correlated with were a, were a um, target of a particular transcription factor. And what that allowed us to do was to identify that this particular gene encoded a protein 
which was an obligate cofactor for this set of transcription factors. We could do that just as simply with eight lines of our code as we could with the very complex models. So I'd still want to advocate doing things easily when possible. And from this, we've managed to develop drugs. The instructive points that have come from, for example, Ivy and Watson for oncology and Memorial Sloan Kettering, I think, are important. Obviously, this is an amazing effort to try and identify decision support to help patients with cancer using um, Watson. But as you probably know, there's been a lot of criticism of this, where some of the initial evaluation has suggested that the Watson supercomputer recommended unsafe or incorrect treatments, but then there's been a lot of defences of this, and it's a fascinating story to follow. I guess the real lesson for us out of this is that it's the training set that really matters and how you use the training set. These training sets were relatively small compared to most AI algorithms. Nevertheless, there's you know, massive expansion into this area. So I just wanted to really end with this last slide. This is Leroy Hood, who's a friend of the University of Auckland. He's one of the doyens of systems biology, as you know. He comes over here every now and again. He's given us a lot of great advice. In an um, article in the MIT Technology Review in 2010, he said we had 10 years' time before we had billions of data points on each individual and medicine became an information science. Well, this is a couple of years' time away, so we really have to hurry up. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, so after a year of digging, this is just a, a summary, I'm not going to go through them, but essentially there's lots of things in Manaki Fenua that we could be uh, applying machine learning to, and the focus has been narrowed down almost exclusively to, um, to image, uh, image problems with one or two examples of, of other things that I'll talk about. So I'm just going to talk about the top um, projects there, which are the ones that are kind of underway now. Um, so a lot of this is around deep learning for computer vision, and, uh, and you probably all know this anyway, but um, the general idea with deep learning or the way we like to describe it is that up until recently machine learning required a lot of um, uh, heavy lifting by humans um, where they did feature extraction of the images in order to be able to classify them with any accuracy. And now with deep learning we have the idea that a deep learning network can do the feature extraction automatically, so you can feed in images and videos in one end, and get classifiers with images and even fancier stuff out the other end automatically. Uh, this is mostly through convolutional neural networks, uh, which is actually quite an old um, uh, technique that was invented in 1989. Um, and the idea with convolutional networks, again, as uh, most of you probably know, is the idea that you are looking for patterns in localized areas on an image, and therefore you're looking for patterns that are not um, dependent on their position in the image and so forth, and this gives you much stronger models. And um, the deep part comes in as we stack these things up, so we go from very low-level abstract features to more high-level ones, and then eventually we get to layers that are getting near to the output, which are um, producing patterns that are quite similar to the exact domain that we're in, in this case, human faces. Um, so I started playing with this actually before I came to Monarchy Fenua in 2016, but it's in a related domain. And that is there was a project starting up uh, called Cacophony, which some of you may have heard of, which is about um, trying to um, track the last 5% of animals uh, of um, uh, pest predators. Um, so I was um, uh, looking to use this as a student project at Canterbury University, and the problem back then was we had absolutely no computing horsepower whatsoever. So how could we turn that into something we can even vaguely do? Uh, we basically uh, took this video, lots of video from Doc, we uh, extracted a number of images, say around um, a few thousand, and we gave it to the students. The students had to downscale it massively, they had to throw out most of the images because they couldn't handle them all. But they still somehow managed to come up with a, with a pretty simple convolutional neural network with a result that was actually way better than we expected. So already back then, even using these um, primitive convolutional networks, we were finding we could do a pretty good job of identifying that there was a possum in that image. Of course, this all then got overtaken by some recent revolutions. Um, the uh, GPU revolution really hit its straps in about 2016 when the Pascal version of the GPUs came out. Um, so I have one of these at home that I do uh, a lot of experimenting on, and this gives me roughly 140 times the power of my CPU. Uh, in, in a desktop computer. So that uh, meant that the stuff we were getting the students to do, which might have to train for several hours on a tiny amount of data, can now be done in minutes on that machine or we can scale the data up. Um, and so of course if we've got all this extra computing power, what do we do with it? Well, the other re um, revolution taking place has been um, the various improvements on deep learning such as um, the Google Inception architectures where we're now using much, much more complex architectures in these convolutional networks. The architect architectures have structures within them, and this is all about reducing the amount of computational power you have to throw at them, reducing the number of parameters in the model, so the models can get deeper and deeper and do increasingly, um, uh, increasingly complex levels of abstraction. And the deeper these things go, and, and the wider the better they seem to get, um, the latest versions of these that I've seen around anyway now have thousands of layers of convolutional uh, convolutional layers in them, and um, these are the sorts of, uh, of uh, networks that can take 20,000 classes of images, several billion images, and produce extremely high accuracy classification. Um, we, uh, for all of the stuff that we've been doing at Monarchy Fenua so far, we pretty quickly settled on TensorFlow. Um, one of the reasons was that that 2016 student project, we did try using Theano and it nearly killed that um, project altogether because the students trying to use it at home found it too difficult to install it and make it work. Uh, TensorFlow is quite, it's really good because if you want to be a, a low-level hacker, you can work down here and do really cool stuff. If you don't know anything about this stuff at all, and in fact you haven't even got much data, you can start at the top, grab someone else's pre-trained model, write an incredibly small amount of code, and have an out-of-the-box, um, basically something working on your domain, and I kid you not, um, in 30 minutes, you could have something working. 
Uh, and TensorFlow also gives you nice um, visualization tools for being able to look at how your training is um, going uh, along the way. So things like what is the loss uh, in the network as it proceeds through training. And probably more importantly, one of the important aspects about doing computer vision, especially if you've got a small number of images, is how you can pretend to make that a big number of images. And you do that through augmenting the data set, which means you take the images and you distort them on the way through. And so here's an example, just looking at TensorFlow, where it's, um, it's learning to recognize certain images. The images are coming in, and rather than passing those images into the network, it's, uh, in this case, what it's doing is taking a random crop of the image, which also has a random aspect, meaning that you have just uh, randomly zoomed, translated, and um, stretched that image, and potentially done other stuff as well. So the more of that you do, the more one image can look like lots of images. Um, and finally, this was also mentioned earlier, um, transfer learning. So if you've only got a small number of images, it doesn't matter how much um, computing time you throw at it, you're probably not going to do a good uh, job of um, building one of these models. However, there are now plenty of pre-trained um, models out there that have used large numbers of images. This particular image is from something called the Serengeti data set. So if you were looking at um, trying to classify animals, uh, large animals, this would be a, an excellent one to start with. That's 30 years of camera, um, uh, camera images. It's just millions of images um, that have already been trained into a, into a decent network. Um, you have ImageNet, which is a common one people start with. That's a general purpose set of images. Very, very well tagged because it's tagged back to the taxonomy of the English language. Um, so if I put in a, a, an image and I tag it as my Alsatian Fluffy, um, it also knows it can use it as a positive example of a dog, a mammal, or an animal, and so forth. Uh, and iNaturalist, which is all about living things. So if you were looking to classify animals or plants or whatever, that's a good place to start. So the idea with transfer learning is simply that you take one of these uh, already trained networks, you basically um, tell the training to keep all of it except for the very last layer that wires it up to the classification, and then you first of all just train that layer, which is quite quick, and then you do a second, uh, second pass over where you also train the rest of it, but not for very long. It's just intended to tweak this bit a little bit to try to improve those filters that it learned to be slightly better than this. And you uh, would be surprised at the sort of accuracy you can get with that um, in a short space of time. And as I say, um, a project I'm going to talk about shortly that I've, I've given to some students on my GPU machine, um, in, with five minutes of training, you can get a model that's up in the 90% accuracies on a new domain. It really is like magic. Um, so some examples of the sorts of things we've been doing with it um, in Manaki Kunua. So I'll be working on a project called Biosecure ID, and this is a straight-up image classification problem. Uh, the idea is that MPI uh, wants to be able to um, trial a prototype of the system whereby they've got some new invasive um, species, they can quickly train the system to recognize that species, and also to recognize that, they've been, that it's been shown something that the system has never seen before, which is a much harder problem. Mm -hmm. We are uh, using three case studies. What these case studies have in common is um, a certain proportion of the images uh, of the species involved are uh, easy to separate, and a human looking at them can do it pretty simply. Um, the other proportion of them, which is maybe a third of each domain, is extremely hard even for humans. Um, and so the question was, if, you know, if the machine learning turns out just to be able to ace the ones that humans can do, what can it do with the ones that the humans aren't able to discern? Um, so the focus of this research is really, um, at the moment, is just exploring the space, looking at the different deep learning networks, how they work on this, how do we go about selecting the network, how do we go about tuning it, um, uh, what is that all, uh, image augmentation pipeline that we need. So in other words, we've got a very small data set here, what are the ways in which we can um, reasonably perturb those images to make it look like a big data set that doesn't destroy information about the domain. Um, we've also been looking at things like can you take multiple of these um, deep networks and join them together in various ensembles and that might be things like um, if I take the entire image of say um, the branch of a plant there could be a lot of important information in that. One of the things um, that uh, people probably don't realise when they first start using these networks is they typically assume that the picture size is quite small. Uh, so a typical number is around 300 by 300 pixels. So if I give it a beautiful high-res image that's 3,000 pixels square, it's going to scale it down and lose most of the information. However, if I supply one of those scaled-down images for the gross um, features and then a bunch of smaller images that are 
automatically chosen very good crops out of that image uh, at high resolution and put that together in an ensemble, can I get better results? Um, and our biggest problem is if we look at the images here and here, these images have been, these are the training images, they've been taken from our collections of Anaki Penua. This, you know, these guys have got beautiful white backgrounds, these have got beautiful black backgrounds. This one does have a pin in it, which is a bit of a problem, but other than that. Um, so we can train and test on this all we like, but when someone gives us an image of a moth they just photograph from a plant, what's going to happen? So we're working on various ways of um, various techniques for simulating the real world images we might expect. Uh, this turns out to work reasonably well. So, so pretty quickly we got 75% accuracy on our, on our plants. I've been using a reasonably uh, modern version of the Inception, Google Inception network. Um, up to 85% on these guys, and not surprisingly, it's those hard cases that are the problem. In this case, this guy here comes in three different variants, which is two variants and a cross, and the only difference between them is the size of the dots on the wings. And that's the sort of thing we're trying to see. Can the, uh, can the um, deep learning network catch it? With the fungal spores, it's actually extremely good on uh, discerning the families. Um, uh, you know, 97 percent accuracy, and again, because of morphological variance and massive overlap, we run into trouble when we look at the species level. Um, so, having done sort of dipped our toe in that sort of area, we started looking at some of the more interesting um, things you can do with deep learning. So, these are kind of add-on algorithms that have that have um, augmented what it can do. Uh, so, one of them is learning time series. So, it has been around for a while. This idea of recurrent neural networks which is a network that has a feedback, basically has connections back to itself that are time-based. Um, and you can model these in various different ways. It's a great theoretical idea that really didn't work that terribly well until uh, something came along called long short-term memory, which is a more complex way of doing this, and I won't go into the details except to say it essentially learns what of the past should I use, what of the past do I now need to forget, and what of uh, like, uh, the, the current output should I blend with all of that to come up with my answer? And the idea with this thing is you stack these things up and they can learn arbitrarily long sequences of um, patterns in history. And they tend to work out extraordinarily well. So this is an example of using long short-term memory. This is the Cacophony project again, 2016. We were barely starting with this. Uh, the cacophony group are now doing this, which is automatically detecting the, the animal in the image, uh, the thermal image, and classifying it. Um, and so the top is the overall classification, the bottom one that keeps changing is frame by frame as it's looking at the video. And that's using one of those long short-term memories. It's astonishingly good, although admittedly it does have a huge benefit that thermal imagery is pretty easy to extract the animal out of the background because it's a little warmer. <laughs> Not so easy with, um, with visual. So that last one is a stoat, that's the hardest one. Um, that stoat went rocketing across the frame. It started off at the beginning here thinking it was other stuff and being a bit confused. By the time it got to about here, which would have been less than a second of, of video, it knew that was a stoat and had a concrete classification. So that's pretty impressive. Um, and this, uh, I won't go through any of this, but this is just to show you there's a pretty complex pipeline that goes into that to get the, uh, from the thermal video to um, a final classification on a, on a, um, uh, on a on video series. <coughs> uh, so another thing that's um, really starting to gain prominence now is object detection. So rather than just saying uh, it's a possum in this image, we want to know where's the possum in this image uh, and what else is in this image. And um, up until about a year ago, there was a thing called, uh, an algorithm called RCNN was probably at the forefront. And what RCNN can do is, uh, being appropriately trained, you'd give it an image and it would give you these bounding boxes, which is every instance of each class you're interested in in that image. In the last 12 months, a new algorithm called Mask CNN has emerged, which goes one step further, and actually then essentially takes what uh, looks at that bounding box, optimizes the pixels in it to work out which of those pixels are most likely to actually part of that animal. So this is actually now covered in all the zebras to say that's actually where they are. So there's a couple of ways we might use that that we're exploring. The first one is, um, here's, here's an even harder problem. We, are, uh, we have all this underwater video coming from the Department of Conservation. They want to know how many fish are in the video in uh, every 60 seconds of every different species, including the great fish, in case you missed it. Um, and of course, the problem is these fish are quite stay still, they include each other and so on. 
So we've just given this to students this year, again, unfortunately, without any huge computing run, but they're going to try to work out how to take that video and to come up with, for every minute of the videos, the count uh, for each species. Um, another way we can use object detection, which is a, a, a very different use case, if we've got aerial footage, in this case of some forestry in Hawaii, and we trade it on a particular species, can it um, then say, well, these objects that I've detected in the image is where that species is. And so that's an ongoing project. Um, lastly, of, the, of the, the different things we're looking at, this has nothing to do with computer vision whatsoever, but you heard earlier about these amazing um, uh, things that Jim talked about earlier, for example, of, um, where you take free text and other information and you um, parse it and you come up with relationships between things and so on. Um, this is actually what stuff I did at Winyard a few years ago, but if we forget that this is about motorcycle gangs and pretend instead of the names in here are scientists, <laughs> their areas of interest, the experiments they performed and so on, this gives you a, um, uh, basically by doing the same thing, entity recognition, relationship analysis and so on, you can get a, um, a quick view of the scientific community in New Zealand. You might search for something like deep learning and drill into who the people are, what the projects are. Um, so, just tying this up now by bringing it back to Nessie, um, I said earlier that I've got one of these machines at home, that's one there, um, that costs about $3,000, the Thunderbirds are extra, and um, that, sort of, that takes a standard task such as the endless data set from 8 hours down to 6 minutes. So the question then becomes, well, why would I bother using Nessie when I can have that kind of run on my computer? And my answer to that is, um, the sort of, just imagine the sort of scale we could get we were using Nessie. Um, so first of all, we would be able to use, uh, we'd be able to deal with real-time data in a real-time way. We would be able to share all the data that we have and produce massive training sets um, that we can do training to get really, really impressive models. Um, and uh, we would be able to provide a toolbox of AI tools for the masses. Thank you. Thank you. So we're um, at about we we're running slightly late, we're at about the time when the schedule says we should be having a general discussion. And this sort of why Nessie and, and what sorts of things is, uh, should we be doing with Nessie rather than be doing with, you know, a box under your table, um, is, is, is part of the sorts of things we, we want to talk about. So what sort of opportunities are there? Uh, and, you know, people want to start off perhaps by talking about questions raised by the speakers. What, sort of, what sorts of areas are there where people would like to use this stuff, things that they don't know or would need to know, or um, people who know this stuff and want um, problems to work on, uh, any of those sorts of things. Um, so, I think there is a way that um, NESI could be kind of like dead AI engine um, connecting lots of domain scientists together so that you can reuse code or pipeline things. <coughs> yeah, um, leading sessions on, say, how to set up TensorFlow and make it do something with you know, similar um, domain people so that you find like, this year. Get stuff that's, yeah. Yeah. So I, think, I think that's quite a natural way. Um, genomics, like the ARI is a natural kind of group for the genomics community. But there's still lots of room for um, kind of sharing workflows and tools within so, it. So, so some of the issue is getting people to, I mean, part of the point of today is for people, for people to know about what's available and so on. But part of that, that is part of the challenge, is getting things available to people and also reducing the cost of trying it because if you have to, you know, if it takes you from the, the point where you think this would be a really good idea to when you actually do your first calculation, um, you like that time to be as short as possible, not you know, uh, there's, going to, there's going to be a certain amount of paperwork time just because even Nessie isn't unlimited. But there's, um, but yes, yeah, so that, that question, what, what sorts of things can be done in order to reduce the cost of starting to do these things because I think that's often the problem that if you've got good resources like this at the back 
then once you start to do them, you can find out whether it's worthwhile and make progress. But actually starting to do it's a bit of a really barrier. One of the, uh, the interesting dichotomies I've found in Menaki Pinawa uh, is with the same scientists I, I found you could go quite quickly from this is of no interest to me and I don't see why it's even relevant to so where do I upload my images and just see if it works? Yeah. And um, the other thing is getting the quest is examples that go beyond images. So images are obviously one of the things where, uh, I mean, they're interesting because deep learning is better than anything else is at images, and that's not true for all domains. But uh, there's a lot of things that aren't images that these sorts of tools could be useful for, and obviously the chemistry stuff. Uh, but uh, also a lot of the genomic stuff. As Chris said, when, when the um, RNA sequencing stuff got turned into images and then fed to a Google image network, is that really an efficient way of going from RNA sequences to uh, results? Uh, or is it just that we happen to have really good image classifiers and you know, if, if, you've got, um, if, if you've got inception there, then anything looks like an image? Um, yeah, and also the transfer learning, I mean, that's, that seems that in a lot of applications that's going to be very useful. I mean, obviously for images, but also possibly in situations where you can do cheap, not terribly accurate simulations, and you might be able to then, and then, I mean, I, I don't know to what extent that's, um, that has potential, but I know that deep, something that DeepMind has done with robotics things is you have cheap, you have simulations to train it on, and then you have a small amount, well, a relatively small amount, not a ludicrously large amount, of real data. But in my work for simulations, you have relatively cheap simulations uh, to train, and then you have a smaller amount of expensive simulation to um, update um, once it knows what sort, you know, roughly what atoms look like or whatever. Um, yes, I actually wondered that was the first tool uh, in terms of how you decide the quality of a model and can you, is there a kind of bootstrapping method there where you could take models that already work? This is assuming there's some kind of generality of how models work across the subdomains. And you, so you take models that you know already work and you essentially use um, output sequences from them as training data. Uh, to do a kind of reinforcement learning to go, can I get can I get to that point with my model that, that's using um, uh, genetic alpha evolution or whatever to to fine tune it? Um, can I come up with a meta model that essentially matches the properties of the one that you know? And then one of the in the other direction, one of the difficulties with that is the same thing that you said about your models on the white background, and also some of these. I mean, the pneumonia one of the pneumonia image data sets has got this unfortunate thing where images taken with a portable x-ray machine get classified as pneumonia and that's because you use portable x-ray machines on people who can't get out of bed to go and um, over to the x-ray department uh, and so you know those learning features you don't you don't want your um, chemistry simulation to decide that all big models are sort of fuzzy and all small mo molecules are um have nicely placed individual electrons um, but that, I mean, that's another thing that people, it's not, people also need to learn, we need, need to be, have ways for people to learn this stuff, but also ways for people to learn, learn its failure modes. And one of them is obvious that you run it forever and nothing happens. But there are other ones, like it learns very accurately by cheating, which is another, you know, something that people aren't used to in, with previous classification and uh, regression approaches. Just, uh, just one point I'd like to make, um, it might be worth clarifying that at, a, at an abstract level, deep learning, the deep learning algorithms we're talking about, they don't work on images, they work on data that has a two-dimensional aspect to it, so you don't have to think of it as images. So in Chris's case, they weren't necessarily images you would look at, they were just something two-dimensional. Once you think about it that way, you start thinking about matrices, you start thinking about other problems that come into play. So, um, how we have a sort of Show of hands, how many people have actually used, how, how many people have used the current NESI um, infrastructure since it moved to Wellington? Yeah, okay. Um, how many people have used uh, some sorts of um, neural network models? Okay. How many have used them on NESI? 
<laughs> so there's definitely room for our progress there. Um, and are there, um, if, can we get some examples of other, other um, health or medical or whatever domains that people are working on that they would like to try this sort of um, computation and model for? Just sort of brief, very brief um, sentences. Things. Do um, agricultural genomics, so depending how good a bull stool is, are producing milk. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so we've got a number of problems there, um, trying to rank the evaluation bulls, or that what their daughters would be, and trying to also screen them for, um, you know, every one of us has got 70 mutations that are in the days likely to be significant. So that's just straight off the top of your head. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, so I would have a different kind of a comment to that, right? So, most AI success happens with data. Yes. Right? So, I, I didn't see anything mentioned on the slide of talking about, you know, for an AI engine, you know, it has to be data. So, yes. maybe we should follow people that have data, that own data, yeah. that are collecting yeah. data, that are funded to collect data, and so forth. Yes. Are there, are there people in the room that, that do that here? Yeah. I mean, so this is all, I mean, in a sense, the people, the scientists are going to know about what data they've got. But yes, this is going to be, if you've got data, these are the questions. But if you've got computing, then the question is, who's got data? Uh, especially very large sets of data. Um, and so, I mean, again, the agricultural genomics, they've been... You We've know, got a lot of data. Primarily, I mean, I, used to, I work in human genetics, and one of the, you know, moving to New Zealand, one of the things in New Zealand is that the mammal that is genotyped in New Zealand isn't the human, it's the cow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so other people with uh, applications, this thing I want to mention. Uh, plant invasions and complex landscapes. Oh yes, so plant, yes, invasive plants and yes, uh, and so you've got, and that is this new plant invasions or existing ones that we're trying to stamp out or both. Uh, wild and common, so mm -hmm. uh, existing ones, mm -hmm. but continuing to. Mm -hmm. And with, I mean, the sort of the picture, the, the sorts of drone image stuff is that is that the sort of data that. You might be interested in, in yeah, using. Yeah, some of that, and then some relatively high res satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. Okay, others? Can I ask, uh, ask about an application yeah. on, on NESI? Given that for a small number of thousands, you can have a machine with 10,000 CUDA cores very happily in your lab. Uh, for me, one of the real <coughs> challenges is actually building a large number of models and looking at them. So, so in statistics, we would often you think things like the carrot package to be able to build many models with different parameters at once. Is it possible to combine HPC with the uh, Nessie Cray AI to build a number of models and choose the optimum in parallel? Yes. <laughs> well, yes. Yes, it is. I mean, yeah, short, an short answer is yes. Long answer is that it takes a little bit of work. It will take a little bit of work, and it will be easier in uh, Eureka 1.2. Yeah. Um, uh, most of the people we talk to, um, when they talk about a, uh, an investigation, they say that 80 or 90 percent of their time is spent doing the extract, transform, and load. It's very data intensive. So, so um, in uh, the analytics package that we um, developed for, for the Cray, for the XC50. Um, we have uh, a lot of packages that are designed for um, uh, data reduction, data processing, like Spark or R, things like that, uh, uh, Dask. So um, these are designed specifically to support the uh, deep learning packages also. So um, you can use uh, supercomputer power to do your data reduction. And then once the data is reduced, uh, which is still usually quite large, um, you'll have access to the deep learning packages on the same system. So it makes things easier. And that's an advantage that you'd have over using uh, Nessie over uh, simply doing it on your desktop. So if you did their data reduction on a large cluster or something, um, getting it to your desktop would be sneaker net or several days or, or things like that. 
Yeah, so the large storage and transformation is another mm -hmm. advantage of doing this. Um, and large, I mean, large, fast, very large, fast um, storage is also, is probably more expensive than CUDA um, if you're trying to get it on your. Um, so I got a question. There's a bottleneck in deep learning that we didn't really mention is, okay, we have terabyte of data, but we need to have human to label those data. Yes. And so that can... data labeling is actually the highest cost somewhere. Yes. And how would we be able to elevate that or yeah. go and around I, that problem? And I think that's going, think, yes, and so data, you, you need, if you're going to tell the computer, needs to know that you're looking for possums, basically, rather than trees. Um, but, and I think that's going to vary, but if you've got, um, that some of these, I mean, the, the, you know, the advantage of the sort of transfer learning things is that you don't need so many human labeled images. Uh, and there's quite a lot out there because before, because people have been labeling these things for a while. Yeah, that's the, the reason general, why yes. image recognition work well because we already have this basic yes. thing, yes. but in other domain where we don't have anybody to label because it's, del it's very specific. So that's why we probably don't have that much of attraction in or yes. easy yes. to build exactly. model. Yeah, and so I mean the two domains where. Uh, where it's done really, domains where it's done really well uh, are either ones where you can make up the data and so you don't have a labeling problem, or ones where the internet is willing to label the data for you, where you have image processing and language processing. And so trying to get things to work in situations where people haven't already built up a whole bunch of labeled data is going to be tricky. But some of the medical applications, for example, come with labeled data because the labels are why you're collecting the data, in a sense, that if you've got, um, if you've got people with cancer, for example, then they come labeled and that's why they're being studied. Uh, so, uh, so some of the medical applications um, have got labels. But it's harder for, I mean, the weather stuff, for example, it, it would be hard to, um, uh, you, you had, I mean, basically no one had labeled the stuff in a sense, and it came with, the, 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 the Seattle weather data, you were, oh no, you had the rain, the rain was yeah, just, that's, yeah, it's, 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 that's just it's adding the measurements out. that yeah, yeah. exist. Yeah, exactly. It's a predictive model. Yeah short-term predictive model, and so you, you know the past future. And yeah. So, yeah. yeah, and then for the other for the other one, an intern labeled the data. Yes, simulation. Yes. And so that's, yes. the, the simulation. so that's the scaling um, question, is that there's a limited number of um, interns scale, <laughs> scale quite as well as, there hasn't been a 300,000 fold increase in the supply of interns since um, Alex met. <laughs> So, so one comment I would add to your question about labels being bottlenecks is you don't have to use deep learning alone for your labeling. Right? So you use some of the unsupervised methods to organize your data better. That becomes more of your exploratory phase of creating labels on data. So you could say, you know, I have channels of image data, but I don't have labels, but I want to organize the pixels in using my heuristic. The heuristic could be, you know, I'm looking for all red pixels in 40 channels, right? So those kinds of organization is what becomes ETL tasks that make you create the labels a lot easier than you could do before, right? So and if you're going to do hundreds of those tasks, you can program them as trivial rules that, that go run on big machines. So if trying to do it one by one on each image for you, guys, right? So the example I showed with the, the non-matrix factorization methods, right? I don't have to create how the pixels group. It's going to give me a heuristic to group the pixels. And then I decide if it's valid or not. And then I curate it based on my theoretic knowledge and say, hey, I know that my images should be in this space, it should be norm of less than 10. I'm just making it up. But, but you can specify those kinds of things to organize your data itself. So you could use some of these unsupervised techniques to, to label data, to organize data, to start using those labeled data to create more labeled data. So, so, yeah, so you, yeah. So uh, a couple years back, I was working with a computational chemist. And, the label, and we had about 1,000 labeled data points because it costs hundreds or thousands of dollars to obtain one, to do one experiment. This wasn't working very well. Because uh, you know, a, thousand a thousand molecules is not going to be the most diverse set, and you're, going, you're running into exactly this bottleneck. 
Uh, so what we did was we solved a different problem first. We trained a model to predict easily computable chemical properties on a couple million molecules, trained, the, trained a model, and then we fine-tuned the model on the smaller data set, and we got state-of-the-art results. Uh, so techniques like this are being developed really everywhere because this data bottleneck is a problem people are aware of, and a lot of the solutions end up being domain-specific, but they come from ideas that can be applied to other domains. And so we're getting to the end of our allotted time here. Could we, I mean, on somebody from Nessie, if some, suppose that somebody wanted, you know, this afternoon, they decided, I want to do this, what, in, you know, a few sentences, what, how would they go about getting access to one of these things? Some Nessie person. Right, so, <laughs> I will jump on this one and then... Everyone can throw things at me when I get it slightly wrong and, and correct me. Um, first of all, you'll go to our website, www.nessi.org.nz, -E um, and follow your nose to um, applying for an application, um, which will have already scared all of you off doing this, I'm sure. Um, what we do have in that system is um, something called a proposal development project. So that is your um, few hundred out hours or CPU core hours free for a month to just get on the system and try it out. So um, that is what we have, Thomas, for um, just get on the system and try it out. Uh, once you have tried it out and you're, you're really interested, um, then you apply for a proper project. And there's a bunch of mechanisms. Um, probably if you're in this room, um, you have access to to Nessie in some way. So if you're at one of our collaborating institutions, you can um, access it via their channels. Um, still go to our website and we'll direct you there. Um, if you're not a collaborating organisation, so you're outside of University of Auckland, Manaki Whenua, University of Otago or Niwa, um, if you've got a research grant from a New Zealand grant provider, um, you're probably eligible for free access. Um, talk to us, have a look at our website. If you're a postgraduate student, you have at, at a New Zealand Research Institute, you have free access as well. Um, go to the website, and um, if unfortunately you don't tick any of these boxes, come and talk to us, um, and we'll, we'll work out a mechanism for you. I can say that they're very helpful to students. I mean, I haven't had to. You know, my, a, a few of my students have, have worked with um, Nessie people, and they've always been very helpful. So, Excellent. okay, so this is the. Um, we're now out of time. Um, I'd like to, well, somebody else probably should be doing this, but uh, I'm the one up here. So thank everybody <laughs> for turning up, and especially thank the, the great people for coming all this way to present to us and, yeah. and talk to us. And we're now done. The, the, the attractive things being said on the back are for a, a different session, not for another <laughs> session later, not for this one. So um, we're all done, and thank you, and um, goodbye. Um, um,